Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Eisenhower presentation. Please stand while Chaplain Brigadier General Green invokes the blessing and remain standing for the national anthem. Please bow with me. Almighty God, we give thanks to you for allowing us to come back together at AUSA this year. In your wisdom, you called us to a life of service and purpose much bigger than ourselves. Be with us as we pause to honor the life and legacy of an exemplary soldier, military leader, and extraordinary statesman in the person of Dwight David Eisenhower. Grant these exceptional non-commissioned officers, award recipients, continued excellence in service to continue to serve our grateful nation for the honor of the recognition bestowed upon them and for their outstanding service and accomplishment. Our Heavenly Father, may each of them continue to exemplify a winning spirit and may they encourage and influence others to do so as well. We humbly ask that you continue to lead and guide each of us gathered here and around the world as we do our parts as soldiers, civilians, and leaders to always be ready to support and defend America's ideals, values, and way of life. And may the light of liberty illuminate our path while in service to our grateful nation and the United States Army. People first, winning matters, army strong, amen. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose but stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight were the ramparts we watched were so gallantly seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the President and CEO of AUSA, General Robert Brooks Brown. Well, welcome. Uh, it's great to be here. Welcome to the Dwight David Eisenhower presentation. And the theme this year, America's Army and its People transforming for the future. There's no other event like this in the world and no other place to learn from and enjoy uh, for more than 650 exhibitors from around the world participating in this year's event, along with many professional presentations and resources uh, available uh, during your three days here. I would like to rec recognize uh, several special uh, guests in the audience. Uh, first of all, our Medal of Honor recipient, Master Sergeant Leroy Petrie. Our Army leadership, uh, thank you so much, uh, Secretary, for being here. Obviously, the Chief has to be here. He has no choice there, and, and Sergeant Major of the Army. And then we have two former Chiefs of Staff with us, uh, the 33rd Chief of Staff, General uh, Dennis Reimer. Thank you, sir, for being here. And the 34th Chief of Staff, uh, General Eric Shinseki. Thank you for being here. I 
I would like if, if all active uh, command sergeants major and sergeants majors would please stand. The bedrock of the Army. Please stand up, sergeants majors. Come on, don't be shy. There we go. Unbelievable. And if I do say so, you look very sharp in those uniforms. It looks great. Makes me want to sign up for another 40 years. Uh, just unbelievable. Uh, I'd also like to welcome uh, all of those individuals who have been selected as non-commissioned officer of the year and soldiers of the year at their home stations, and all our uh, drill sergeant of the year, recruiter and career counselors of the year, and all the other outstanding soldiers. Would the outstanding NCOs and soldiers please stand? Got to be so proud, the best of the best here representing their commands. But we also have uh, today very special guests, two Olympians. So I'd love to recognize uh, first, first Lieutenant Amber English, gold medalist in the 2020 Tokyo Olympics in women's ski, and an Army Reserve soldier. and a clutch performance, if I do say so, to win that gold. It's a fantastic job. And then Staff Sergeant uh, Sandra Uptegraff, Olympian in 2020 Tokyo Olympics and also an Army Reserve soldier. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We're really pleased to have all of you with us on this occasion and uh, applaud all the hard work uh, being done out there, represented by those folks we just recognized. Well, traditionally, uh, the uh, Army Chief of Staff and Sergeant Major of the Army have used this venue to make presentations of Army awards to outstanding soldiers, the ones we just recognized. So if at this time, General McConville and Sergeant Major of the Army, Grinston, will you please position yourselves on the stage and let's recognize some well-deserving soldiers. With the recipient of the Stephen Ailes Ralph Haynes Jr. Award, please come to the stage. The Stephen Ailes Ralph Haynes Jr. Award is presented annually by the Department of the Army to the Outstanding Drill Sergeant. This year, Outstanding drill sergeants representing all the United States Army training centers competed in a headquarters U.S. Army training and doctrine command competition for this coveted award. The 2021 Army Drill Sergeant of the Year is Sergeant First Class Travis Burkhalter. With the recipients of the General Maxwell Thurman Recruiting Excellence Award, please come to the stage. The General Maxwell Thurman Recruiting Excellence Award is given each year to the Army Recruiters of the Year. During General Thurman's tenure as commanding, commander of the U.S. Army Recruiting Command, he significantly improved the quality of Army enlistees and helped create the professional army of today. He played a key role in fostering the public's positive perceptions of America's army and its great soldiers. His influence left a mark on army recruiting and set high standards for today's army recruiters. The non-commissioned officers selected as the top army recruiters for 2021. From regular army, Staff Sergeant Donggi Kim, 6th Recruiting Brigade. And from the United States Army Reserve, Sergeant First Class Rigoberto Rodriguez Fernandez, METCOM.
Would the recipients of the Army Retention Excellence Awards please come to the stage? The Excellence in Retention Award is given each year to the Career Counselors of the Year. Retaining the very best soldiers is critical to the Army's mission of growing and developing leaders for the future. Career counselors support Army commanders by identifying and counseling soldiers and non-commissioned officers of their value to the force and potential to serve in positions of increased responsibility in today's and tomorrow's complex world. The non-commissioned officers selected as the top Army Career Counselors for 2021. The Army Career Counselor of the Year is Sergeant First Class Jackie Lord. The Army Active to Reserve Career Counselor of the Year is Sergeant First Class Morgan Smith. I know, it's crazy. Can I get the band? Keep going. <laughs> hey, uh, we did, they're like, Sir Major, it's gotta be on script. You can't do anything improvised. Yes, we can. <laughs> Sir Major of the Army, this is the Army, we can do anything. Um, yesterday during the NCO luncheon, we recognized the uh, NCO of the year and, you know, classic move on off script, anything. I just wanted to announce, Sergeant uh, Carlin, please stand up. The NCO of the year for the Army. I know we recognize you at lunch, but just in case you missed the NCO, everybody was at the NCO. And then the soldier of the year, Specialist Earnhardt. The best soldier we have right there. Hey, hey. Hey, wait a, wait a minute, Sergeant Major. Uh, the Soldier of the Year competed against hundreds of thousands of other incredible soldiers in the Army, and he won Soldier of the Year. And winning does matter in the Army, so Sergeant Major, I think he's ready to be a non-commissioned officer or sergeant. So you could come up here, and, and the power is vested in me as the Chief of Staff of the Army. We're going to promote you to sergeant right now. How about a hand for the newest sergeant in the United States Army? Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of applause for all of our outstanding non-commissioned officers. Well, that's, that's the best off script I've ever seen, Sergeant Majors. Great job. Uh, congratulations. So today we're very proud to have with us the 40th Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Since becoming Army Chief of Staff more than two years ago, uh, General James McConville has been very clear about his top priority, people first. He's ensuring the Army adjusts its policies, programs, and procedures to take care of people.
The Army is also going through significant modernization efforts to ensure our soldiers have the best equipment to win on future battlefields, and at the same time, maintaining a trained and ready force. I tell you, we're very fortunate. We have the right leader at the right time as our 40th Chief of Staff. Gives me great pleasure and a real honor to present General James McConville, Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Well, good, good afternoon and welcome. And welcome to everyone that's live streaming right now. America's Army and its people are transforming for the future. First, a special thanks to General Bob Brown, my West Point classmate, and his team for putting together this fabulous event during a challenging time. Bob, who would have thought 40 years ago that we'd be here today? But before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the great loss that our Army and nation suffered with the recent passing of our 38th Chief of Staff, General Ray Odiano, after a brave battle with cancer. He was an incredible leader and a devoted husband, father, and grandfather. And I considered him a personal mentor for me and always cherished his sage counsel. So please join me in keeping General O and his family in your thoughts and prayers. You know, I'm privileged to work with a great leadership team, led by Secretary Wormuth and supported by our acting undersecretary, Mr. Chris Lohman, our Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General, General Joe Martin, Director of the Army Staff, Lieutenant General Walt Pyatt, and Sergeant Major of the Army, Tony Grinston. And I'd also like to recognize the Army's Senior Warrant Officer Advisor to the Chief of Staff of the Army, the Chief's Chief, CW5 Dixon Carter. And to all the former secretaries, our chiefs that are here, vices, as well as all the general officers, sergeant majors, and distinguished guests, thank you all for joining us today. I want to acknowledge our, one of our great American heroes, Master Sergeant Leroy Petrie. Thank you so much for being here and what you do every single day to continue to represent our army. And I'd like to thank our Gold Star family members for being here today. Your loved ones gave all, and we'll never forget their sacrifice or, or yours. I'm pleased to welcome so many of our allies and partners. Thank you for coming. I'm proud to serve alongside you. Finally, I'd like to recognize General Carter Ham as he begins his next chapter in life. General Ham served his country with honor and distinction for 37 years in uniform and did, then did a tremendous job leading this association for five years. His team did a fabulous job of putting on last year's virtual event, but it wasn't quite the same as recording this speech in the Pentagon studio. Something was missing, and that something was people. And I'm so happy to be back here with you today. You know, the United States Army exists for one reason to protect this great nation from all enemies, both foreign and domestic. And we do this by being, by remaining ready to fight and win the nation's wars as a member of the Joint Force. This has been a uniquely challenging time for the Army. But each challenge in each crisis has only made us stronger. And throughout it all, we have never wavered on our priorities. People number one, readiness, number two, and modernization, number three. For me, people will always be the United States Army's greatest strength and most important weapon system. Our soldiers in the active Army, the Guard and Reserve, their families, our Army civilians, and our soldiers for life, our retirees and veterans. This past year, has reminded us time and time again why people are our number one priority and why it's so important to get the right people in the right place at the right time. People like our Army medical professionals, scientists, and logisticians 
working to get our nation through this pandemic. It was an American soldier, my friend, General Gus Perner, who answered the call to lead the mass production and distribution of COVID vaccines under Operation Warp Speed. And it was American soldiers, active duty, Guard Reserve, who set up the alternate health, the alternate care facilities. It was American soldiers who deployed to community hospitals across the nation and gave hope to exhausted local medical professionals. And it was medical, and it was American soldiers who stood up multiple mass vaccination sites across the country to put actual shots in arms. People like our Guard and Reserve soldiers and the incredible job they have done this past year. They came to the rescue of their neighbors during multiple natural disasters, all the while continuing to protect the nation in global operations. The Army National Guard and Army Reserve have experienced unprecedented demand at home and abroad, and they are doing a fantastic job. People like our Army Olympians, who we recognized earlier. And again, I want to repeat, Lieutenant English holds the distinction of being the first U.S. service member to earn an Olympic gold medal. People, all right, how about a hand for that? People like our soldiers from the 82nd Airborne Division, the 10th Mountain Division, the Red Bulls of the Minnesota National Guard, and our Special Operations Forces, and many other soldiers who supported one of the largest evacuation efforts in our history. These American soldiers helped evacuate over 120,000 people from Kabul. Today, over 9,000 American soldiers are working with the interagency worldwide to help Afghan families transition to new lives. An American soldier, along with 11 Marines and one sailor, gave his very life, ensuring thousands of others might live theirs. I had the honor of meeting Staff Sergeant Ryan Kanasa's family and teammates. And can I can say with absolute certainty that he represented the very best of who we are and what we aspire to be as an Army. Putting people first means continuing to build cohesive teams that are highly trained, disciplined, and fit, that are ready to fight and win, and where each person is treated with dignity and respect. Putting people first means aggressively getting after our quality of life priorities, housing, health care, child care, spouse employment, and permanent change of station moves. Putting people first means progressing with our 21st century talent management systems initiatives. We are expanding our assessment programs after the success of BCAP for battalion commanders and CCAP for colonels to now include sergeant majors, acquisition leaders, and chaplains. This fiscal year, we'll finish rolling out IPS-A with all components integrated into a single personnel system. Soldiers will, what, will have what I call component fluidity. I can envision a future where soldiers will be able to serve across multiple components according to where they are in their careers and where they are in their lives. We are providing opportunities for soldiers to hone and employ their talents that benefit the Army the most. Last April, I, vid I visited the newly opened Army Software Factory in Austin, Texas. The Army needs soldiers who can code under pressure and in the dirt. We believe that this talent already existed in the Army, and our soldiers did not disappoint. We are finding hidden talent in the most unexpected places, like an E-4 combat medic like an automotive maintenance warrant officer, like a former baker, baker. And these are self-taught soldiers with PhD level coding skills. We are making sure that they keep these skills in the Army because we are aggressively seeking to recruit and retain the talent we need to remain the greatest fighting force in the world. 
Putting people first means taking care of our people so our people can remain ready and transform for the future. Because the United States Army must be ready to fight and win as a member of the joint force in order to protect the nation. That means fighting while being contested in every single domain. If you look at the best combat units in history, everywhere in the world, you'll find individuals in small units who are masters of their craft. And so we will remain ready by focusing on foundational readiness. That means building units from the soldier up. That means we give squad leaders, platoon leaders, and company commanders the time and resources they need to build cohesive teams that are highly trained, disciplined, and fit so they can fight and win. That means building our battalions and brigades upon that foundation to create an army that is ready for large-scale combat operations, an army that is agile and adaptive in contested environments. We are changing our readiness model across the force. Effective this month, we will officially adopt the originally aligned readiness and modernization model that we call REARM. REARM regionally aligns our units with combatant commands to deepen institutional knowledge. REARM increases predictability for our people by getting our units into cycles for training, deployment, and modernization. REARM will enable us to take care of our people without sacrificing readiness for today and while transforming to stay ready for tomorrow. Because the United States Army must transform for the future, and we are. And I argue the Army must transform about every 40 years. In the 1940s, we transformed for World War II under General Marshall. Forty years later, in the late 70s and early 80s, General Shai Meyer oversaw what he called one of the most ambitious transformations the Army has ever attempted in peacetime. To a large degree, that is the Army we've fought with since. General Meyer was the Chief of Staff of the Army when I, when I came in to the United States Army. And today we are following in his footsteps as we undergo our greatest transformation since his time. And it's fitting that we'll honor him tomorrow at Arlington National Cemetery when he is laid to rest with honors. The battlefield is becoming faster. It's becoming more lethal. And it's becoming more distributed. Overmatch will belong to the side that can make better decisions faster. And we are transforming to provide the joint force with the speed, the range, and the convergence of cutting-edge technologies to gain the decision dominance in overmatch we will need to win the next fight. And when I say speed and range, I'm not just talking about the speed and range of a single weapon system, but of the entire process. As some of you may know, I used to command a division that had a lot of helicopters. And when I learned, it was great that our helicopters could fly 100 miles per hour. But if it took us 10 hours to plan and execute a mission, our net speed was 10 miles per hour. We might as well have driven a truck at a lot less cost. So we are transforming our doctrine. In March, we released Chief of Staff of the Army paper number one on Army multi-domain transformation. In the upcoming months, we'll update our capstone doctrine with a new FM-30. We are transforming our command and control systems to support multi-domain operations and joint all-domain operations. That means working with our sister services in the development of combined joint all-domain command and control, or CJADC2. And I will continue to add a C to JADC2 because the joint force never wants to fight alone. We are stronger when we fight alongside our allies and partners. The Army's contribution to CJADC2 is convergence. Project Convergence is our in the dirt experimentation to inform how the Army will fight and organize in the future. 
by linking all sensors to the best shooter through the right C2 node. And last year, Army Futures Command hosted the inaugural Project Convergence 20 at Yuma Proving Ground. And that was really about the Army getting its all sensors and shooters integrated and right. This year, as I speak, Project Convergence 21, PC 21, has expanded to include the joint force. And the lessons we learn will inform the joint warfighting concept. PC 21 incorporates over 100 technologies across more than 20 sites with over 5,000 participants. PC 21 will consist of seven scenarios, what we call use cases. As, a, as an example, one of those use cases is the joint air and missile defense, something we're very concerned about. If there's an incoming missile attack, first we want our systems to be able to identify it. Then we want our systems to determine the best shooter, and not just between Army weapon systems, but between services. Is the best shooter a Navy SM-6 or an Army Patriot missile? These are the kind of options we want to give our combatant commanders, and these are the kind of dilemmas that we want to give our potential adversaries. That's what the decision dominance is about, being able to take a tremendous amount of data and act on it at the speed of relevancy, in tens of seconds instead of tens of minutes. Next year for Project Convergence, we'll expand again to include the combined force our allies and partners. We continue to transform our organizations. All six Security Forces System Brigades are now operational. All of our five active duty SFABs are aligned with the combatant commands, and our National Guard SFAB will support each of these. These units are critical for developing partner capabilities and enduring relationships, because the United States Army never fights alone. Last month in Germany, we activated the Army's second multi-domain task force, the first of its kind in Europe. Our MDTFs will provide commanders with long-range precision effects, including intelligence, information, cyber, electronic warfare, and space operations. And they will provide long-range precision fires capable of penetrating enemy A2 AD defenses, sinking ships, in establishing friendly A2 AD defenses. And we continue to transform our training to harness virtual and augmented realities. Our efforts are already paying off. One World Terrain, one of our 31 plus 4 signature systems, provides de detailed 3D replicas of locations throughout the world. Two months ago, the 82nd Airborne Division used it to recreate the Kabul airport and facilitate evacuations from Afghanistan. That is amazing. And we are transforming our equipment. And I think of equipment modernization efforts in terms of three distinct categories, legacy, enduring, and future. Legacy systems equip the Army of the past, and we are divesting of legacy systems. Endurance systems equip today's Army and will play a key role in tomorrow's Army. Weapon systems like the Abrams tank, the Apache helicopter, the Black Hawk helicopter, Paladin PIM, and Patriot missile systems. We are incrementally improving these enduring systems to keep them relevant to the future fight. Future systems are necessary to equip the multi-domain Army of tomorrow. And this is where we are transforming. These are our six modernization priorities in 31 plus 4 signature systems. And I'd like to give you a quick update on the great progress that we are making. With long-range precision fires, last month we failed the first prototype of our extended range cannon artillery, Urker, for testing. And in FY23, we will field hypersonic missiles, our ship sinking mid range capability, and our precision strike missile systems, PRISM. With next generation combat vehicle, this year we are building physical prototypes of the optionally manned fighting vehicle. We are testing eight prototypes for the robotic 
combat vehicle ahead of its original schedule. This year, soldiers are testing a next light tank, mobile protected firepower, and the first unit will receive the armored multi-purpose vehicle this year. With regards to future vertical lift, the first prototype of FARA, a future attack reconnaissance aircraft, will fly in the third quarter of FY23. We accelerated our future long-range assault aircraft program, and FARA will choose a prototype later this year. The Army Network. You know, the Army Network may not be our, our official number one priority, but it underpins all of our modernization efforts. It must be resilient, it must be reliable, and it must be able to operate in the dirt in a contested environment. This is the heart of Project Convergence. And when it comes to air and missile defense, this year we will field the Integrated Air and Missile Defense Battle Command System. Last April, we began fielding our first maneuver SURAD air defense systems, MSURAD. Two weeks ago, we awarded prototyping authority for the indirect fire protection capability. And soon we will field prototypes of directed energy based counter UAS systems because I believe that enemy unmanned aerial systems are the IEDs of the future. Last but certainly not least, soldier lethality. Our soldiers are currently using and testing IVAS, the Integrated Visual, Visual Augmentation System. We continue to field the Enhanced Night Vision Goggle Binocular System, which gives our soldiers better depth perception, rapid target acquisition, and augmented reality in all weather and all lighting conditions. In this fiscal year, we are fielding our next generation squad weapon systems. All told, all told, we will have 24, and I say again, 24 of our 31 plus 4 single systems in the hands of soldiers by FY23. America's Army and its people are transforming for the future. And I'd like to end with an update to a story I told the last time I was on this stage. Two years ago, I told you about an American hero named Jim Pee Wee Martin, a member of the greatest generation and a screaming eagle who jumped into Normandy on D-Day at the young age of 23, and he fought across Europe with his band of brothers. And I had the honor to meet Jim when he jumped back into Normandy for the 70th anniversary of D-Day at the ripe age of 93 years old. And two years ago, I told you he had jumped in again for the 75th anniversary of Operation Market Garden. He was 98 years old. Wow. This year, I'm happy to report that Jim is still going strong. And last April, he celebrated his 100th birthday near his home in Ohio with Pee Wee's Jump Fest, a mass parachute reenactment celebrating Jim and his fellow 101st veterans. Now, we stand on the shoulders of heroes like Jim Pee Wee Martin. And every one of us in uniform carries an obligation to live up to their legacies. And to the men and women of the United States Army, past and present, you are doing just that. And let me take a moment to speak directly to the soldiers and soldiers for life who served in Afghanistan over the past 20 years. What you did matters, and what you did made a difference, and nothing will ever change that. You did your job, and you did it incredibly well. And you can be proud of your service in combat because I and the American people certainly are. And I cannot be more proud to serve with the greatest soldiers in the world's greatest army. And it remains my honor to be your 40th Chief of Staff. Because in the Army, it's about people first, winning does matter, and we do remain Army strong. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, Chief. Uh, powerful words. We stand ready to support you, uh, the Secretary of the Army, and your team as you lead the Army. That's for certain. Before we conclude, uh, let me encourage you to visit the military exhibits, the contemporary military forums, and the demonstrations, as well as the industry exhibits located in the Convention Center. It's a great chance to exchange ideas and learn something new. So we'll see you down on the event in the exhibit floor. Thanks again for joining us.